Thank you so much for inviting me today. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you guys could hear me very well. Um, like Mary said, my name is Vijay Pandian. I am a horticulture extension educator for Kenosha and Racine counties. And I do serve Milwaukee County uh, with 10% of my time. And um, primarily, uh, in a, I do both consumer and commercial horticulture program in this part of the region. And I also um, in a, do most of the plant diagnostic training program as well too, and also provide consumer consultations in the world of gardening. And uh, so with that, let me share my screen. And like Murray said, I posted the handout of my presentation in the chat box. And it's roughly about like uh, 8 MB, I would say. So you could be able to download it. So um, fall is one of the great time for me. I enjoy you know, doing a lot of presentations and talks in the fall time. Um, and it's a great time actually to go back and reflect you know, how the season was um, this year has been. And speaking of the season, okay, um, reflecting back, this has been a very unique uh, growing season in a lot of different ways. Um, we all know that it's been fairly a very dry season and it's been very unusual. And uh, it's not only actually in uh, Wisconsin, in throughout the world, that seems to be a quite a bit shift in the weather condition, it seems like. And you would have heard quite a bit in plenty of those information on the news. But here in Southeast Wisconsin, to what degree that has been a dramatic change in the weather this year uh, is. So um, here's a statistical data, climatic data that has been presented here uh, by the Midwestern Regional Climatic Center. And this is the data from like last 10 years actually. And this is the precipitation data. So if you look, in 2012, we kind of relate back to 2012, you know, that same kind of dry conditions. And here's the 21, 2021 data here. And it's quite similar to 2012, except that it's a quite a bit difference here is that in 2021, we had a very early spring. And I think in the decade or so, I think this is the first time uh, our spring season in Wisconsin naturally coincided with the official spring day in March 15. But Unfortunately, if you look into it, it has been very dry. I mean, you know, we got only in the month of March, only about 1.12 inches of rain in the month of March and April is the same. So it's been a very dry spring season and which is a bit different from 2012 data. And similarly in the growing season in the Southeast region, we had a very dry spell as well too. We didn't have that enough rain. And in average, we got about like, you know, 1.97. We got about like in the month of July, about 1.97 inches of rain. So in total, till about like end of September, our total annual rainfall this year is only 18.77, which is very, very low. Even you know, if you consider October, November, December, we get about a five inches of rainfall. It's still it's fairly low actually compared to the other years. I would say, so it has been fairly a very dry season. In particular, I would like to say that in Kenosha County, we've been under extreme drought. So this is the U.S. Drought Monitor Station, and uh, for the you know, for U.S. and specifically in Kenosha, if you look here you would see actually we are under exceptionally very, very dry condition right up here. So the US drought monitor labeled us as extreme dry. And look back here on the right side, the precipitation has been very, very low compared to the rest of the counties uh, in the Southeast region, as well as in the rest of the state. We are, you know, very, we had a very scanty rainfall. Usually our precipitation should be in the average range per month of more than three inches. It's very, very, very low. And especially in the springtime is very low. So we had a very dry spring and also very dry growing season. In addition to all this dry weather condition, we had an abnormal temperature as well too. So that further aggravated actually this year's summer. So this year, uh, this is an average temperature range that we have, this green bar that you see here, the green shade. This is where the average temperature that we, have, we usually get. But all these black color bars are the one that indicate the temperature above the average. So in total, we got actually 
more than 51 days by the temperature during this growing season were above 85 degrees Fahrenheit. This is not good for the plants. Most of our temperate plants in the upper Midwest region, they can tolerate about 85 degrees for only about 30 to 40 days or so. So we had unusually about 51 days where the temperature has been above 85 degrees that further stressed out Cordia for landscape plants. So the impact of the drought is very severe this growing season. And one of the short-term impact is the loss of photosynthetic activity. Even in the middle of the growing season, we can see many plants, they are simply shutting down. They are either turning into fall coloration mode, like the service growing that we can see now, as well as this uh, river bird, which is completely shut down. It. It's actually a depletion of uh, energy that has been supposed to be stored for this winter. So which makes this plants, most of this plant vulnerable to the cold temperature. Many of our landscape plants don't enough have food reserves right now to overcome the winter. So it'll be a very interesting winter season to see. The other important short-term impact is that because of the low food reserve, they're gonna have actually, they had it in the June and July month. They don't have enough energy to produce any future vegetative birds and flower birds for next year. So we're going to have a poor blossom production for next year as well, too. The other important thing is that many of these stressed plants, they're going to have become vulnerable to pests and diseases, especially like birch trees, oak trees. They're going to become vulnerable to bronze birch borer, or the oaks is going to be vulnerable to two-line chestnut borer. And you know, you're going to see some of the diseases that are going to um, looks like someone's mic is uh, turned on. I'm kind of hearing a lot of that. Thank you. So keep that as a background in your mind when you're thinking about how are you going to prep your landscape for this upcoming winter. Say. So with a lot of stress baggage that is going around with many of the trees and shrubs, what can we help the trees and shrubs? How do we actually ease the stress load of the trees and shrubs so that they can able to better cope up and withstand the upcoming winter? In the past, we, we were able to actually predict the winter. We usually supposed to get more than one feet of snow or something like that. We could able to predict actually by end of November, early December, we're gonna get snow. But in the last few years, we know for sure that, okay, it's become unpredictable. Our winter temperature seems to be fluctuating drastically Sometimes it's actually in about like 40s and 50s. Sometimes it drops down to minus 20 with the polar vortex. So this upcoming fluctuating winter temperature is the scariest part for many trees and shrubs. Because many trees and shrubs, once they go into the dormancy mode, uh, it takes actually for them a while to regenerate back again. And once it regenerates back again, it can't Im immediately shut down back to dormancy. Let's say, for example, if the temperatures in the mid-January mid supposed to be in about like 40 degrees, they want to even go to dormancy mode by 40 degrees. So it means that, and if the temperature suddenly drops to 20s, then they're gonna face a lot of winter injuries by the time. So this fluctuating temperature is gonna be very stressful for the plants. So with being said that, the first thing you may wanna think about is to try to avoid any major pruning activities on many of your trees and shrubs. In most cases, if you're gonna think about pruning a large land, try to you know, uh, withhold those, those pruning to about in springtime. Spring is one of the best time of the season to do many of the major pruning for many trees and shrubs. Because in the springtime, what happens is that the tree will have enough energy and they're very active. They will try to seal the wound as much faster as they can. However, there are certain exceptions in these cases. For example, if you do see a dead branches, broken branches, then certainly you can prune it at any time of the season. If you have a oak trees or elm trees, probably beginning by November till about like mid-March, you can prune them. You can call and certified arborists to do those pruning because oaks and elms are more vulnerable to their uh, diseases. Like for oaks are vulnerable to oak wilt, elms are to Dutch elm diseases. So to avoid pruning these trees during the growing season, it is best to prune these two trees during in the dormant time. 
And if you have a smooth leaf hydrangeas like Annabelle hydrangeas, you can actually mow them down probably by end of November. So these are some exceptions where you can do some pruning probably beginning in end of fall. But the other important thing is that many of us have a, do have a very well established trees. And sometimes you know, we may have some dead branches or some of the branches of the trees may not structurally look that good. Or they might have been stressed out. They may have a cracked box. And if you do have those kind of weird symptoms that has been showing on your trees where you have a dead branches, cracked box, or if your tree is one half has been dead or it's been leaning too much, then in those cases, call a certified arborist to assess your trees. Before the start of the winter, it is better to assess your hazardous trees and get it checked and see if it's really you know, necessary to keep the tree or it is better to you know, take it down. So that's another important activity you need to do before the start of the winter. Evergreens are very different because they tend to retain the needles through, uh, even during the going uh, through the winter time. So, which means that they will continue to transpire during in the winter time. Now, we are so fortunate that in the last couple of weeks we got rain, but during the growing season we didn't have enough rain. So, we don't know how the rest of the fall season is going to be. If in case our fall season continues to be very dry then probably it is better to water those evergreens, including your conifers or including your broadleaf evergreens. You know, give them at least once a week about a one to one and a half inches of good soaking water until the ground freezes. You may ask me a question about when does the ground freeze? Usually in the past, if you ask me about like in you know, a six, seven years ago, I would say by end of November, close around like Thanksgiving or first week of December. But these days it's very hard to predict. Uh, but I would still you know, go around with the notion of, you know, right around like, you know, mid-December, you can start until, you can stop watering until that, so. The most important thing I would also recommend is winter mulch your young trees or your young shrubs. Or if you have a marginally hardy trees and shrubs, winter mulch them. So you can use wood chips, bark chips, you know, you can mulch those young plants. Young plants which are recently planted or even planted within the last five years. Or even if you have your fruit trees, like your peach trees, peach, ap apricots, or nectarines, or those trees are actually are very marginally hardy for Wisconsin. So probably you may wanna think about mulching them. Mulch them to, when the ground starts to freeze, usually about like six inches of mulch, you spread the mulch till up to the drip line area, but keep the mulch about few inches away from the bark of the tree or the trunk of the tree. But in the spring comes in, you can break those back mulch again. You can reduce your depth about three inches. Don't leave it like up to six inches. So winter mulch, what it's going to do is that it's actually going to provide a blanket for many of the root zone areas. In case we don't have enough snow cover, these winter mulch is going to help them in protecting the root zone. Many of us think that, okay, you know, why do we need those mulches? Why do we need those roots to be you uh, know blanketed with these things? Well, to be, to be uh, the fact is, even the shoot system could be hardy to about like minus 20 degree Fahrenheit, but the root systems are not that really hardy. Many plant species, they are, the root systems are hardy only to a temperature of 18 degree Fahrenheit. So in case if you do have a polar vortex or if you have a temperature drops further down in the ground, then probably these winter mulch will help. Or if you have a tree roots, which is cl quite close to the surface of the ground, then probably these winter mulch will help in protecting those roots. So it is actually uh, more of an insurance for those roots zone to be protected in case the snow, if you don't have enough snow cover. So the next one is if you have any container grown woody plants, now is the best time to shop for, actually one of my best time I would say to shop for some many woody plants would be right now. Uh, the reason is, you know, you're going to get a very discounted price. Many nurseries and garden centers, they want to get rid of these plants. They don't want to store them and haul them back again into the shed or in the greenhouse. So if you have any, if you plan on purchasing any of these things, uh, though it may not be a good time to plant right away uh, because we have a you know, very short window and many of these plants may not able to acclimatize to, the new, uh, to your new soil condition. So it might be best what you can do is actually you take a dig a pit uh, in a protected area, like underneath your shrub or a nearby a tree, uh, you know, somewhere actually it has been protected from the western wind. Dig a pit about 10, 12, 10 to 12 inches deep and as wide as you want. 
and you place those container grown woodies are your shrubs, are your, even your ponyas, and you bury those containers till to the rim lava. And make sure to water them, give a good soaking water. And when the ground starts to freeze, you mulch them. And this is one of the easiest way to, you know, um, protect these woody ornamentals that has been grown in containers uh, for the winter. And then in the springtime, you can scoop those things out and then you can plant them back actually in a, uh, in a desired spot in your landscape. Uh, this technique also works very well. If you want to have a container grown bloomery plants, you can also do the same thing as well too. So think about that and think about shopping at this time of the year. Uh, if you want to get some more discounted prices for many of your woody plants, including herbaceous perennials. If you have a hybrid tea roses, uh, I think you may want to start thinking about killing them up. Uh, hybrid tea roses, one of the great, one of the important thing is that their graft union can become vulnerable to winter temperatures. If you have a fluctuating winter temperatures or if you don't have enough snow cover, those graft union, which are about a few inches above the ground, you'll see a small swelling actually there. That is a graft union where the rootstock and the scion meet. And that area needs to be protected very well from the upcoming fluctuating winter temperature. So one of the strategy that we use actually we recommend is that first, you know, prune those canes. These hybrid tea roses canes can go over like five, six feet. So you cut them back to about three feet and then tie the canes together. And then you start mounding them about 10, 12 inches with some good top soil if you have, or if you have your own garden soil, mound them. And once the ground starts to freeze, then add some layer of leaf mulches on top of those things, and then put some evergreen branches on top of it just to hold the leaves. If you don't have evergreen branches, put up a chicken wire around to it just to prevent those leaves from blowing out. So this type of techniques, it works very well for hybrid teas. Uh, then in back in the springtime, probably in April, you can start uh, raking those things back again. Uh, by end of April, you can completely remove the mound. So this is one of the easiest way of overwintering those uh, hybrid teas. Uh, we would not recommend any using any rose cones and stuff like that. In the past, they do recommend that, but there are studies that have shown that they can build up the heat inside. So it is not a recommended strategy. If you have a shrub roses, established shrub roses or established climbing roses, then they don't need actually this much of uh, you know, overwintering techniques. Uh, you can leave them like it is. And then in the springtime, you can come back and cut back any of those kind of damaged canes. But if you have recently planted your shrub roses in a year or so, then probably just put some you know, wood chip mulch around to it, about like three to six inches uh, when the ground starts freezes, that may help. One of the no most notorious things that's gonna really damage your trees and shrubs are either the, it's gonna be a bunnies or it's gonna be the deer. They can really cause some major damages to your shoot system very well. And, uh, to protect these, uh, your valuable plants, especially the young plants, which are smooth box, like your crab apples, your lindens, your Japanese maples, and those things, it's best actually to use a tree guard. So this tree guard, you can get it at any garden center. It is nothing but in a, a white drain tile pie. It's a corrugated drain tile pie, and that you can wrap around the tree. So you place them actually probably in late fall, and one of the mistakes this homeowner that made actually is that she forgot to take in this in the back in the springtime. You should not leave this permanently uh, around the tree during the growing season. So it is best to take it off um, in a, during the uh, early in the springtime. And this strategy works really well for rabbits and deer. And you can also get two layers and you can also put it one on a bow if your tree is actually is further taller. So this works very well for young trees, which are about like a two to four inches in caliper in size. Voles. Voles are like called as a middle mouse. They have a tiny ears and a tiny tail. And if you do have a pile of wood chip mulch or compost, uh, that will be a safe haven for this middle mouse or the voles, uh, you know, to habitat during the winter time. They actually are very active even during the winter time. So, and when they get strong, they actually uh, either, they will gnaw the roots of the plants or probably the grasses, the roots of the grasses, or even actually choose, um, you know, uh, the, um, the base of the tree. 
And they can cause some extensive damage, especially to a young trees like apples or even your smooth bark Japanese maples. They do cause extensive damage to these things. In the lawns, actually, you might have seen actually when the uh, snow starts melts in the springtime, you will see all these runway trails, uh, which are commonly caused by these bulls. Uh, it doesn't cause that much damage in the uh, lawns because the lawns quickly recover and they fill in all those you know, trail areas. But on the trees, on the other hand, it's a different story. So once the uh, tree bark has been stripped off more than 50%, the tree is gonna likely gonna get damaged or die. Uh, in those cases, I would say right now, start putting up a chicken wire or a hardware cloth around the base of the tree. Make sure that the chicken wire or the hardware cloth is buried about six inches into the ground and then wrap it around to the base of the, uh, around the bark of the tree. In that way, you can protect them uh, from the wolves. Herbaceous perennials. I know you may start thinking about cleaning your perennials uh, right away in your hosta bed or a peony beds, you know, they might have already gone dormant. Uh, but if you have a bunch of mixed perennials, some of them are still green, some of them are completely brown and they're, it seems like they've gone dormant. But if you do have a mixed bed, probably it's best to clean them probably in late November when the ground starts to freeze. I mean, there's nothing wrong actually cleaning right now. I mean, you know, it's perfectly fine. It's just simply that some of them might be still green. They may hold the energy right now and they might be still doing some photosynthetic activity. They were sending some nutrients back to the root system. So chopping them or cutting them down right now, you're kind of depleting right now. So it is better actually hold, up, hold them off and do it in all in a one shot in like late, late November. So um, when you're gonna actually cut them down, I would recommend actually also, you know, raking those chopped, um, um, you know, um, leaves and everything back into your compost pile. You don't want to leave the dead stuff hanging in the soil because you know they may have insect, uh, they may have insect eggs, or they may have a disease spores. You don't want to leave them back into the soil. So it is rather you break them back and you put it back in the compost pile, and then get a clean straw or a hay and you mulch it and mulch to about six to eight inches deep. And when you're gonna spread those clean straw or hay, just fluff them up. Don't pack them completely. Just fluff them and you place it around the crown of the tree or on the top of them. And then back in this, in early in the springtime, you can break it back again. And this mulching will really help, especially if you have a marginally hardy herbaceous perennial, uh, including your hardy uh, um, hibiscus. It really works very well. The mulch helps a lot. Some of the perennials, you don't have to cut them back, like your coneflowers or ornamental grasses, they add some inter interest and they provide some you know, food for the birds as well during the winter time as well too. Now it's also a great time to plant your spring flowering bulbs, tulips, daffodils, you can plant them six to eight inches deep. You can even go to the month of November to do these plantings. So, um, in terms of herbaceous perennials, there's not much can be done. I mean, it's uh, easy to grow. Um, and uh, it's probably fairly less maintenance compared to the other landscape uh, that you have. If you have a native prairie plants, uh, now it's a great time actually, in the fall is one of the great time to harvest them and spread the seeds. So one of the easiest way is to bag all this, you know, native prairie seeds, and then you can broadcast them. Now, there are a couple of things uh, you need to remember. All these seeds needs to be stratified. So the mother nature does the stratification process for these seeds. What do you mean by stratification? So typically these seeds are naturally dormant and they need certain you know, chilling period or the cold temperature for them to get you know, uh, reactivated. So the embryo needs to be reactivated. So for at least for a couple of months, it needs to be in cold temperature. So winter is a place an excellent role. So you could actually cover the seeds and you can broadcast it. And then the mother nature will take its course in you know, cooling them down and help them in germination. But that is a bit of a drawback in this strategy by broadcasting simply. Is one, probably when you broadcast them, these seeds needs to have a good soil contact for them, for them to germinate successfully. Unfortunately, if you have a large prairie area, it's probably you may not able to do that. Second of all, these seeds could be chewed up by any rodents. So you're gonna see a lesser damp, uh, you know, lesser germination as well too. Or sometimes it's gonna get eroded uh, as well too. So one of the best strategy I would say is that in the fall, 
harvest these seeds and let them yeah dry and put it back in a paper bag and store it in your cool basement or in your refrigerator, not in your freezer, in your refrigerator. Then in the middle of the winter time, like in January or February, if you, if you happen to have any kind of plastic jugs or milk cartons or even like a, in a milk jug, what I would tend to recommend is that cut them in a half way. Uh, don't cut all the way around, just half way uh, or three fourth, and then put some drainage holes at the bottom of the container, just like in this picture where they cut three fourth of the way and then put up a potting soil uh, onto it uh, and then spread some seeds and then put some more potting soil and further on top of it and then label this container and set it outside in the month of February. So in February, March, you know, they will be exposed to this cold temperature where they're gonna get stratified. And then in spring in April, you will start to see them germinating inside this container. And then you can scoop the transplants and then you can plant them into a smaller containers or you can do some direct transplanting into the ground as well too. So this type of you know, transplanting techniques works very well. Uh, this milk jug technique works very well in helping these prairie seeds to get stratified. And it's easy also for homeowners actually to have a successful prairie establishment in a small landscape. So moving on, uh, now is uh, also a good time to start cleaning up your garden. And there are a lot of reasons why we need to clean up the garden. Um, if you're a lazy gardener, probably you may wanna rethink about it. Uh, if you complain about a lot of weed seeds keep on coming up every year in your garden, uh, probably you know it's because from the last year. So last year, if you didn't do a good job in cleaning up your garden, probably all those weed seeds would have deposited in the soil and they will start germinating back in the growing season back again. So the, one of the main primary reasons to do a good garden cleanup is to reduce a weed population. So in gardens, we have common porcelain, uh, um, uh, pigweed, lamb squatters, teasels. These are some of the common weeds that likes to germinate and grow in our garden. So if you do wanna reduce those weeds, probably start doing some good cleanup in the fall time. The another most important thing is the pest and disease pressure. And um, this also uh, goes back again to the weed population as well too. In the fall time, many of these pest and diseases, they tend to overwinter or alternate nearby your weedy patches as well too. So it's also one of the reasons why we need to clean up all those weeds, take get rid of those weeds. And again, by raking all those you know, dead leaves and stuff from your ground, it's also going to reduce your pest and disease population as well too, and that's going to further reduce the pressure for next year's growing season as well. And also to prevent some rodents like bulls, bunnies, you know, they, they tend to overwinter, you know, if you have a, an, in an unclean garden. So to prevent them, it's also better to clean up. And we don't know how the spring is going to look like. If you happen to have a wet spring, you don't want to walk in the wet muddy area to do some cleanup. So if you could find some nice sunny day in the fall time, that'll be the best time to do this cleanup. Um, don't, you don't, uh, don't walk actually if the ground is so wet or if it's during the rainy time, you might actually spread some uh, diseases as well as some carry out some weed seeds along with you and you might spread up in your garden. So do, it is best to do it during a sunny day, dry sunny day. Now, before we start thinking about cleaning up your garden, if you do have some cold season crops, like your cabbage, broccoli, kales, and collards, leave them like it is. They taste very good actually in late fall time. So don't harvest it uh, until late fall. Um, and you will, um, you'll be amazed on the quality of these uh, cold crops in a, that has been harvested in late fall. And now is also best time to plant garlic gloves. Um, you can get those garlic clouds in your farmer's market or into a seed company and you can plant them in your ground or in your raised beds to about like an inch to inch and a half. And um, you plant these clouds and then when the ground starts to freeze, you mulch them. Mulch them to six inches with using a clean straw or a hay. And that's fairly easy to grow garlic in Wisconsin. And if you do have other cool season crops like carrots, beets and rutabagas, turnips and horseradish, leave it leave it halfway through the winter time. They will taste really good. Carrot tastes really sweet. And even in the middle of the winter, you can harvest them. So just uh, leave those carrots, some of the carrots and two beets and turnips, 
and you mulch them and harvest them in the middle of the winter time using a digging fork. So it tastes really good. So the first thing in a garden cleanup is that if you have any tomato cages, trellises and things like that, just you know, lift, uh, take them down, brush it up with some brush and, you know, and do a you know, clean up with some water. Um, make sure that there is no plant debris or any soil that has been clinging on to those trellis. Um, so these things will carry on some disease spores. So I think it's best to rinse them off. You don't necessarily have to use any disinfectant unless you know that your tomato seems to be carrying some viral diseases. Then in the cases, it's best to disinfect it with using rubbing alcohol. But in general, it is not needed. The other thing is that in you know, cleaning up your plant debris in your ground is very important. You don't want to leave your leftover tomatoes and or your fruits actually on the ground. So rake those things up and you know by and then you trash it or you put it in a compost pile. It's best to put them in a compost pile. When you're actually removing these plant materials, try to remove them, including its root system, as much as possible because we don't want any of those diseases actually still clinging onto the root system, so it is better to scoop them up. And it's also more important to clean any of these wee patches that is surrounding your garden. So either you can hand pull them, or if you wanna use some Roundup, you can also still use those things as well too in the fall time to clean those things. Especially if you have a thesels, uh, garden like Canada thesels and stuff like that, probably fall is one of the best time to knock them out if you, if you wanna use unique chemicals. But if you prefer not to use any chemicals, then probably I would recommend not to hand pull these teasels because when you tend to pull hand pull, you're gonna break those rhizomes and they're gonna keep on coming back again. So it's better to mow them continuously um, and chop those leaves. In case your plants are dealing with some deadly pathogens, like for example, late blight. We are so fortunate that this year in Southeast Wisconsin or many part of in Wisconsin, we don't have late blight infection, which is very deadly for tomatoes. But in case if we encounter any other de deadly diseases, then probably bag those plants in a black plastic bag, let it get cooked for about a week or two in a full sunny area, and then you trash it in a landfill. Don't put it in a compost pot. Same thing with the invasive weeds. If you have a garlic mustard, uh, it is better not to actually put it back in your compost pile. Or if you are dealing with any other invasive weeds, it is better to actually put them in a black plastic bag, including your Canada diesels. Don't put it back in your compost pile. Uh, in that way, you can try to minimize the disease population as well as minimize the invasive weed population in your garden. Compost. Say, so I really enjoy composting many of the organic matter. It is a, it's a, I would say gardener's gold. I would say compost materials, it's a rich organic uh, nutrients uh, as in a media. Uh, you can enrich your soil with a lot of good quality compost. You don't need to go back to the garden center and buy these things. You can actually make your own compost, which is fairly easy. Um, so all you need to do is to have some minimum compost pile, uh, the green and the brown matter uh, in a appropriate proportion, and that's good enough. But one of the common mistake many people tend to do in composting is that they think that you can add any materials to your compost pot. Some of the materials could be deadly for gardeners. One of the thing is that black walnut. So in Wisconsin, we do have a lot of black walnut trees. So if you do have black walnut leaves or fruit pods or bar, don't put it in your compost pot because these black walnut, butternut, they have an alkali called juglone. And this juglon could inhibit any of your, most of your vegetable garden plants. And when you tend to put them back in your compost, these juglon don't uh, detoxify naturally. So you're gonna come back into your garden and it's gonna actually kill your tomatoes and plants like that. Same thing with the poison ivy. You don't want your poison ivy plant put in the compost pile or any invasive weeds, including your garlic mustard or even your buckthorn plants. You don't put, wanna put them back in your compost pile. Rather, I would trash those things including any deadly plant diseases, as well as any dairy stuff. Um, also sawdust from your treated wood. So if you have any treated wood, they usually have some in you know, a chromium or arsenic type of compounds. And these compounds doesn't naturally decompose itself. So you don't wanna actually put them back into your garden soil. So, so some good example, what not to compost. Um, also one thing I would also make sure that in your compost pile, 
don't put in your treated grass clipping. So during your growing season, if you have a lot of treated grass clipping using 2,4-D or any weed and feed products, don't put those treated grass clippings into your compost pile. Rather, put your treated grass clipping back again into your lawn. And these treated grass clipping have about like a one pound of nitrogen and you can recycle those nitrogen back again into your lawn itself. So in that way, we can prevent any contamination of those treated grass clippings back into your garden. Fall is one of the best time to do your soil tests uh, rather than in the spring. Uh, why? In the fall, if you do a soil test, you would know actually which nutrient has been depleted in your soil and it gives you plenty of time to fix your soil with the appropriate nutrient content. So generally, if your nutrient, if a soil has been depleted uh, with some phosphorus or potassium, or in if your pH seems to be very extremely high, now is a time that if you do a soil test, within a two weeks, you get your soil test result, and you can add this uh, nutrients into your soil and get it prepped. So by spring, you'll be all set to go for planting. And spring is also one of the rush time for a soil test lab to do all the process, all the soils. And it may take more than two weeks actually for them to give you the test result as well too. So do your soil test in the fall time. And how often? Probably once in five years will be a good time to do a soil test. So you can go to a soil test lab where you can download the soil submission form and you can send the sample directly to the soil test lab. So you go to this website, all the information pertaining to soil tests for home and gardens are, are right on this website. So the first basic thing is that when you're doing a soil test, you need to take a good representative samples uh, from your own backyard. So let's say you, know, you have a vegetable garden in your backyard and you have a lawn in your front yard, you need to take a two soil samples to send to your soil test lab, one from your backyard, one from your lawn, if you wanna do a testing for your lawn. But if it's just only for vegetable garden, just you know, take it from your vegetable garden area, select randomly five to 10 different spots in your vegetable garden, go to a, you know, collect the soil samples to about six inches deep uh, in each of those spots, put it in a container, mix them all together, all the core samples together, and take a two cups, put it in a plas uh, plastic bag and ship it to the soil test lab. And generally soil test lab, um, they test for phosphorus, potassium, organic matter content, pH, and they will give you the recommendations based on your type of your landscape, uh, what needs to be done. And the total cost will come roughly around like 18 to $20. Um, that doesn't include the shipping. And just two cups is good enough for the soil test lab to test it. Now, in case if your soil pH, the soil pH is the one that says that whether your soil is acidic or alkaline. And if you, in generally in Southeast part of the Wisconsin, we have alkaline soil. And uh, many plants can tolerate light alkaline soil, but if you have a high alkaline soil, that your pH range is more than like 7.8 or so, then your soil test report will recommend to add elemental sulfur. The elemental sulfur, you can get it at many garden centers or farm co-op and you can spread it in your garden right now. And it'll take about six months to break down in the fall time. And because they have to build up the necessary microbes to break down the sulfur and to uh, reduce its pH you know, to about a, a digit or so. So it takes a while. So I think that's one of the reasons why soil test in the fall is one of the good time, I would say. So, uh, in a, in a, I think, you know, it is a time of the year we might be loaded with some lot of excess tree leaves. And, you know, we can do so much actually by dumping into your compost pile. What should we do with the remining? Well, there are a lot of ways we can actually recycle these fallen tree leaves. One, you can spread it on your lawn and just spread it about one to two inches in a high and then run your lawn mower on top of it. So when the lawnmower runs on top of it, it's gonna chop those uh, leaves and it's gonna recycle back into your lawn. And these organic matters are rich and really good for your lawn. It helps in better promotion of the uh, root growth of your lawn grasses. So in this way, we can able to recycle back into your lawn or you can spread it in your vegetable garden and, and do a shallow uh, tilling after you spread it on your vegetable garden. So you can go to a depth about two to three inches deep and you can till it back. 
or probably you can pulverize these things and you can use it as an alternative to straw and hay in mulching your herbaceous plants. Um, so I would not recommend using like, you know, um, you know full-size leaves, rather I would chop them down because sometimes if you're using like a full-size leaves, they may tend to pack your herbaceous perennial. So it's better to chop them up and you can spread it. Or you could compost it. So, uh, so these are some options, what you can do for, about recycling some of your tree leaves. The, one of the best thing to do for your garden to enrich your garden with some lot of organic matter and it'll be good for spring planting is to try your cover crops. So you don't wanna leave your garden bare in the winter time. You need to protect your topsoil. The topsoil is rich in nutrient. So many times, many gardeners, if you do leave a topsoil, it gets eroded in the springtime. To prevent those things, try some cover crops like winter oats, winter weeds. You can broadcast these things. You can get these winter, winter weeds in farm co-ops or even in garden centers, or you can place them order right now on very seed, seed catalog companies. And so winter woods are very excellent. They will grow faster. And in the winter time, they die. And then in the springtime, you can till them back again, all those dead matters back again to the soil. So it's an excellent organic, it enriches the soil with a lot of organic matter. So I would highly recommend to try some cover crops in the winter time. Last but not least, um, the, I would say, you know, this is a great time of the year to take down your buckthorn and honeysuckle. These are very invasive plants. And in buckthorn, we have a common buckthorn and glossy buckthorn. This picture is a common buckthorn. And now is the best time actually to take down. If you do have a large buckthorn tree, you can uh, chop them down to the ground and you paint the stump with some concentrated Roundup or with some brush killer or something like that. Same thing with the honeysuckle too. Honeysuckles like emu, marrow, Japanese, Tartarians, and Bell's honeysuckle, it's a great time right now to take them down. And so it, why fall is the best time? In the fall, many plants actually send down its nutrients back to its root system. So using any type of like a herbicide, these plants are gonna assume that they're gonna uh, think it's a nutrient and they translocate it into the root system. And once it gets into the root system, it gets knocked down. So fall is one of the best time to treat them, including your creeping charlie that you have, or if you have a creeping bellflower, uh, or even your garlic mustard, you know, this is one of the best time to take, uh, take care of these invasive plants. So if you have any questions, you are more welcome to reach our plant health advising programs. Uh, you can call or text us at this number, or you can email us. Uh, so uh, during the winter time, we do check and we do check our calls and email messages uh, twice or thrice a week. Uh, so please do so. During the growing season, we have enough master gunner volunteers to staff every day. So we check all the messages and we respond promptly during the growing season from April till about like end of October. But during the winter times, you know, uh, it's just me and my another couple, uh, another support staff. We check them uh, every other day. Now we do have a lot of tons of resources published in our horticulture team website. So you go to this website, you will find some updated garden articles, fact sheets, and all those video materials are there as well too. So with that, uh, let me take any questions. Please uh, post your questions, or if you have any questions, be free to you know turn on your mic as well too. So yes, thank you, Avish. You gave us a lot of things to think about here, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Let's um, have people um, unmute themselves and uh, ask away. Anybody out there? What are you doing about creeping Charlie? <laughs> well, creeping Charlie um, is an invasive one. It is actually, you know, belongs to the Eurasian one. It's in the mint family, basically. Yes. And you all know it is a perennial one. And depend upon landscape setting, where your creeping charlie is. For many homeowners, creeping charlie is in your lawn. Now, when you think about you know, controlling a creeping charlie uh, in your lawn, there is a short-term and a long-term strategy. The short-term strategy is that fall is the right time, you can spray with some herbicide. There is a product you know, with an active ingredient called triclopyr. I will spell it out, I put it in the chat box. Uh, you could use this product. 
And the trade name is actually somewhere it's called as in a bond, uh, I think Weed Be Gone for Oxalis. Uh, and that specific product called Weed Be Gone for Oxalis uh, will be very effective in controlling creep, creeping Charlie. And fall is one of the best time because in fall they absorb those things and send it to the root system and then knock it out. So you may wanna do uh, twice, uh, two times an application uh, to do that. Um, so, um, but overall, the thing is that if you knock down one weed, the other weed pops back again in your lawn. And I think probably the best thing to do is to figure out why your lawn failed in preventing these creeping charlies or any other weeds. So there might be something wrong with your lawn. Either there may be a lack of nutrients or maybe you know there may be too much shade going on or they may have some diseases in your lawn. So when your lawn becomes sick, they become vulnerable to all these weeds. And that's why their weeds are invading. So try to find some, do some good cultural practices to boost these growth of your grasses so they will prevent these kind of weed invasions. Great advice. <laughs> and we can still do that now? Yes. Uh, I think you can still go ahead and you know, uh, take care of the creeping Charlie. You can also still go ahead and reseed your lawn. Um, that you can also do that. There's more information about um, controlling creeping bellflower. So creeping bellflower, uh, it could be a biennial or it could be a short-lived perennials. A short-lived perennials means it can live about more than two to three years uh, at the maximum, um, but biennial means for two years. So the first year they form a rosette, then the second year they form a, a flowering star and then it collapse down. So the same thing like with the garlic mustard, Creeping bellflower can be controlled in the fall. So if you do have a creeping bellflower mixed in with your pony of plant, what I would tend to recommend is that wear a gloves, take a roundup, put your kitchen, uh, kitchen's, um, you know, um, any kind of like a kitchen sponge or something like that and dab it on the leaves of your creeping bellflower. In that way, you don't drift it to your desired plant. Or you have to be extremely careful in doing a spot spray on those plants. And fall is the best time because in fall you can transfer. If you feel that I don't want to use any chemicals, then probably then you can keep cutting them down. So if you keep cutting them down, especially the flower stock in the springtime or early summer, if you keep cutting them down, then probably you will deplete its nutrient and then probably it will vanish away in about a matter of three years or so. So somebody has um, asked uh, how do you control pests getting into your compost pile? The best way I would say to wrap your compost pile with using any hardware cloth and try to put up a, you know, a hardware cloth on top of it as well too. So you could find some metallic T poles and you stake them around your compost pile and then wrap it up with some chicken wire or a hardware cloth. And then on top of it also put those, you know, like a lid with them uh, with a hardware cloth and things like that. In that way, you could prevent any of the rats and stuff like that that's trying to sneak into your compost pile as well too. Now in certain municipalities, they do sell some compost bin. Um, so if you approach your recycling uh, center, uh, like for Milwaukee, if you're living in Milwaukee, they do have a recycling center. They'll sell you a compost, recycled compost bins for about 45 to $50, and which has a lid on top of it and perforations actually around the sides of it as well too. Um, so you can also get those compost bed. Or the easiest and simple way is using some hardware cloth, I would say. Good advice. <laughs> and what about raccoons? <laughs> We've had them in there too. What a surprise when you open that up in the morning. Uh, yeah, so the raccoons are a bit different. Usually we find skunks and raccoons in your lawn. Uh, probably they might be digging for some um, white grubs. And so, especially if you have a Japanese beetle white grubs in your lawn, and if you do have a higher population of those white grubs, uh, they might be snooping around. And so keep that in mind because of the white grubs, they might be attracted to your lawn and they may do the, those damages as well. So the best long-term strategy is to next year during the growing season, take care of your grub, but for a short term to prevent the scum from digging in the same spot, I would say actually get a roll of uh, hardware cloth and lay it actually in that area and you stake it and pin it to the ground. So the raccoons don't actually like to get their feet actually cling, uh, clogged up into the chicken wires or the one. So they will tend to leave the spot. 
So that's one of the simple, easiest way to try to prevent them from digging back again the same spot. Excellent advice and, and fairly simple to do too. Excellent. Yeah. So I think we're about running out of time, but um, would you mind going back to the last slide so that people, if they didn't get those two um, like website type um, links that you you referred to, um, if they could write those down. Anybody uh, else with one last question? Absolutely. Um, I did post my presentation handout link in the chat box. So if you right. still didn't happen to get it, um, either you could also reach me up by this email address, or you can also reach out to Mary and she will be able to help you out as well too. So this is our phone number as well as email and our website. So be free to contact us during the growing season or even during in the winter time as well too. Great, thanks. I, I did not see, I, Mary, I did not see any of his posts. You have not seen any. So did you scroll all the way back up to the top? Because yes. it was one of the first things that he, he listed. So. Yeah. If, if nothing else, I can send it to you too, Craig. So, so, um, yep. Did you see the the more recent ones? That yes, I just saw that one, but I did. I also didn't see the uh, the chemical for the creeping Charlie. Okay. I will post it right now. Uh, Thank you. It's called Tricloprid, yeah. and Good. I Thank you. specifically ask for weed begone for axalis. So there are two different versions of weed begone. So the normal weed begone that you see in your garden center where well, it contains 2,4-D and that's good for nothing. Um, so rather I would be very specific, try to get for weed begone for oxalis. They will spell it very clearly. If you look at the right. ingredient area, they will say it's a tricloper product. Great, thank you. I happen to use that product and um, it has a purple colored label, if that helps you at all, um, because that's what I look for when I'm buying it. So look for the purple on, on the container. Well, I want to thank you again, VJ. you've done a great job. We, you know, we all have plenty of work ahead of us um, as we go into the rest of the fall. Uh, everyone remember how little rain we've had this season and get out there and start watering those shrubs so that they're hardy enough to make it through the next winter. And uh, we do hope to see all of you again next time. The next um, Tea and Topics program is going to be on October 28th at one o'clock and uh, the speaker will be uh, Lynn Sheehan and she's gonna talk about raising chickens in an urban setting. So those of you, many of the municipalities these days are allowing people to have chickens, maybe not a rooster, but chickens at least. So so join us next time to find out about how, do, how to do that in your backyard. And uh, you can look forward to having your own uh, eggs then in the morning. So uh, ho homegrown eggs, great way to go. So thank you again, VJ, and I uh, hope to see all of you again next time. Have a great afternoon and uh, thanks for tuning in. And by the way, these um, are all recorded so you can get them off of our website you have to wait about a week but um, just um, google and you'll you'll find the, the presentation on our website so thanks again for all of you to join us today and we'll see you in two weeks bye bye thank you, thank you all thanks vj